want to welcome you all on behalf of the Nantucket Athenaeum and uh, to the first guest view lecture of this uh, 2017 series. We have a very exciting uh, number of lectures uh, this summer. On page three of your program, you can see who's coming, and uh, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty interesting group. Some of you may know Peter Baker, who uh, is Susan Glaser. Peter was uh, assigned by the New York Times to uh, head up their Jeru Jerusalem bureau. And they just moved there for, after five months. He was called back to uh, be the chief White House correspondent because of our new president. And he's uh, been very busy and very happy with that assignment. So we'll hear from him and, uh, and Susan, his wife, who was the editor of Politico in, in, in a couple of weeks. Tonight, uh, however, is um, uh, a very special treat. Uh, I want to, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, say a particular uh, thank you to Chuck and Dan Geschke, who are here. Uh, the Geschkes have been extraordinarily um, uh, uh, thoughtful and uh, philanthropic for many, many causes on the Antarctic. Uh, this lecture series was started uh, with the help of Chuck and Dan and an endowment from the National uh, Endowment of Humanities. I think the Nantucket Athenaeum was the only library that who got a, a national endowment grant. Uh, we've had this series now for a, a while, and uh, uh, it's, it's a particularly highlight of, of many people's summer. So thank you, Chuck and Dan, for your help. <laughs> um, our speaker tonight is uh, this is a particular pleasure for me. And I'll uh, tell you why in a second. Uh, Jerry Rosenbaum uh, has a very, very uh, large job. Uh, Jerry is a psychiatrist in chief of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, we all know that MGH is a really splendid institution, but uh, you may not know that the Department of Psychiatry is rated number one in the country by the uh, US News and World Report. So Jerry heads up a group of uh, uh, professionals uh, it's quite quite large. I think there are 600 affiliated psychiatrists and psychologists, um, 60 specialized clinical programs. Uh, Jerry's department educates maybe 100 or so residents and other professionals each year. So there's research, there's treatment uh, of patients, there's education. Uh, it's a big, big job. And, uh, and, and Jerry is the, uh, the boss of all of that. Now, I'm going to tell you why it's particularly important, particularly nice for me to introduce Jerry. And that is that 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, Jerry and I went to Europe together. Uh, 1968. Uh, we were friends from our hometown in Connecticut. And we did a European tour with uh, $5 a day. Any of you remember that? And uh, uh, so it's particularly a particular pleasure uh, to, to introduce my old friend uh, tonight. Jerry's field is uh, uh, depression, and he's uh, a little leading expert in that. Uh, I'm going to let him tell you all about the treatment and, and some of the things we uh, have to look forward to, perhaps. It's a big, big topic, as, as uh, all of us know. I think it's hard for any of us to uh, not have a family member or a good friend or someone who we're close to that hasn't suffered from that disease. So it's a very important subject. Jerry, uh, Jerry uh, is a Yale guy who became a Harvard guy. He uh, did his undergraduate medical school at Yale. And he's been a uh, professor, uh, the Stanley Cobb professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School for a number of years. And of course, he's been at MGH for his whole career. Uh, Jerry? We have an extra added addition. Lydia Rosenbaum, Jerry's wife, is going to uh, speak for just a second. Lydia. That was lovely, Bob. Thank you. I do have a few words to add. Um, because not only is Jerry a world renowned psychiatrist with a broad and deep clinical experience and research in depression. But he has also had a very intimate experience of living with someone suffering from mental illness. That would be me. I have always been healthy, 
I'm smart, I'm pretty, I adore the man I've been married to for 45 years. I was raised in a loving family, got a great education, raised three healthy kids while loving my part-time career. In short, I got way more than my share of good fortune. And yet, for periods throughout my adult life, I have been knocked flat by depression. I have tried every medicine in the psychiatric pharmacopoeia at one time or another, and some have been enormously helpful, others not. Psychotherapy has offered insights, cognitive behavioral therapy has offered strategies, and for the most part, I have loved my life. But five years ago, it hit hard. I lost interest in everything. I wanted everyone to go away. I slept 14 hours a day and cried the rest, lost 15 pounds, and began to fantasize about contracting some disease that would take my life because I knew that after their initial grief, the people I loved would be better off without me. So there was a new cocktail of meds, and then another ineffective. And finally, my doctor suggested electroconvulsive therapy. We had run out of options. I remember walking in terror down that long hospital corridor towards the door beyond which I would undergo general anesthesia and basically an induced seizure. And I vividly remember that the anesthesiologist said as she was putting in the IV, we'll take good care of you. Mm -hmm. Well, my depression proved pretty recalcitrant, and I ultimately walked down that corridor 25 times. The ECT did finally get me past the crisis and able to try a new drug regimen, and I have been totally well since then. And I'm delighted to be here and telling you this. I still take medicine, I meditate, I exercise, I see a therapist. And I give thanks every day for all the doctors who have devoted their professions to this illness, who treat depression as a challenge that can be met with skill, with art, with perseverance. And I just want to offer you two messages. One, that no family goes untouched. And secondly, that good doctors will never give up on treating depression, no matter how resistant. So now I'd like to introduce Gary Rosenbaum, who never gives up on his patients, or thank goodness, on me. <laughs> to say. <laughs> but Lydia, thank you. Um, Chuck and Nan, thank you so much for this. And Bob, so great to reunite with an, an old great friend after so many years and to be here with you all tonight. I really appreciate your coming. And uh, sometimes it's important to, uh, as they say, uh, um, put your, where your money is. What does it put your and put your money where your mouth is. And um, so that saying, no family goes untouched, um, I think n nothing more eloquently makes that point than, than, than Lydia's uh, moving commentary. You know, we have a uh, group of people, some of them are actually Nantucketers, and one or more of you are here tonight, who are members of our department's leadership council, the group of people who support our work. And it's really their motto they came up with this motto that no family goes untouched. It's not an assertion, it's just, an, it's just mathematics. You know, when you know how prevalent, not just depression, but you know, you count, you know, if depression is one in five, or um, and schizophrenia is 2%, and bipolar is 2%, and panic disorder, and OCD, and eating disorders, and substance use, and you go on and on, and you just add up the numbers, and then you figure out how many 
people are, do we love or how many people are close to us, how many people are our dear friends. And uh, if, that, if our little motto of no family goes untouched doesn't apply to you, well, then you've won the lottery. So I just want to start with that. And the implication of that, and maybe I'll say this now and once at the end tonight, is that uh, this concept of stigma makes no sense. Uh, stigma only means that we're being silent and we're not letting each other know how the ways that we, we uh, all suffer or can suffer. So uh, tonight's talk is about uh, one particular psychiatric disorder, the one I spend most of my time on, which is uh, depression, uh, which is uh, ultimately an inescapable form of suffering with emotional, cognitive, and behavioral torments that don't just affect an individual, but really also reverberate, of course, through anybody they're connected to, whether it's an employer or a family or a loved one, but family and friends. It renders uh, pleasures or things that normally give you pleasure unappealing and makes ordinary life insufferable. It's a state of anguish with loss of interest and motivations, is associated with disabilities of different sorts and mortal danger. Although depression, uh, as we understand it, is brain-based, you, sh you should know it is also a bodily state of di distress that has far-reaching impacts on our physical health and well-being, uh, not just emotional. It's not just something that affects emotion and thinking and executive function and motivated behavior. It also affects uh, our, our physical function more globally, and I'll say more about that in a moment. It is prevalent worldwide. It's not, no society is spared. Uh, in 2015, in the US, 6.7% of the population at any one time suffered depression. That's 16 million people had a major depressive episode. Lifetime, it afflicts about one in every four women and about one every 10 men. It's an interest, you know, uh, there's this sexual dimorphism in the brains and female brains and male brains are different. It's not that uh, male brains are more vulnerable to other disorders as it turns out like autism and schizophrenia and women more anxiety disorders and depression. Um, but depression does afflict women a bit more commonly and is also more associated with hormonal fluctuations, and you see a surge in, in uh, depression in uh, girls compared to boys at puberty, and then a, a equalization again post-menopause. Depression, um, however, even though we call it depression like it's one thing, is, is, not, uh, is not one thing, it's not one disease, but it's a very heterogeneous group of diseases that just somehow all get called depression. By convention, there are a set of nine symptoms that are used to make an official diagnosis of depression, or as it's uh, uh, diagnostically termed, major depressive disorder. This just keeps tipping in my face, it's gonna fall, so let me just see if I can get the right bounds. I'm gonna take this out and just do it this way, okay. Um, so depression is, uh, is, is much more variable than we think about it as, as just one condition. There are a set of nine symptoms that are used to make an official diagnosis of depression. Um, and um, you need five of these nine symptoms to be officially diagnosed, and you need to have at least one of, or, uh, of two core symptoms. Those core symptoms are depressed mood or loss of interest or ability to experience pleasure and normally pleasurable activities. So you have one of those two, then you need to have a total of five, and the others include changes in your sleep function, which can be sleep continuity disturbance, you can't sleep through the night, or oversleeping, as Lydia mentioned in, in her case, um, feelings of guilt or uh, excessive self-deprecation, uh, changes in your energy level, fatigue are common, changes in your cognition like concentration problems, changes in appetite, which could be loss of appetite in certain forms of depression, but sometimes increased appetite, overeating, 
changes in how your body works, so slowing of your bodily functions in general, but sometimes agitation. And finally, um, morbid thoughts, which often focus on death or dying. But although those are the official symptoms of depression, I, I have to say that they do not really uh, capture many of the most painful features of depression. Depression can feature many more symptoms, and I don't think people should get caught up in the those nine or that that, that or or even the diagnostic category um, that we use. Um, for example, you know the memory problems or cognitive problems or the problems of impairment and attention that come with depression. Another big feature of depression is irritability. People have angry outbursts, uncharacteristic irritability that is so impairing that is a part of depression, and yet that's not one of the core symptoms. Hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, those feelings are very common features of depression. Bodily pain, um, changes in gastrointestinal function, anxiety is very common. And um, one of the common features that's not in those diagnostic criteria is a phenomenon we call rumination. So some of you may know what rumination is, but it's a I'll, I'll say more about it in a moment, but these are a variety of uh, um, symptoms that uh, are, are featured in depression. So that if you take just one of those, like rumination, what that is is a, an experience of stuck thinking, usually dwelling on something quite negative about oneself, about an event that just occurred, about something you did or didn't do that you just can't get out of your head and you keep thinking about. And it can move on to other things, so it's different than obsessional thoughts in that way. So rumination is a kind of repetitive, non-productive stuck thinking that can occur in depression. And many of these symptoms are not limited to depression. Uh, many of these symptoms can occur in other psychiatric disorders and rumination can it as well. So it, it makes the point that depression is, uh, is quite variable. In fact, if you were to take those, just the nine symptoms and not the myriad of other symptoms that depressed people can suffer, and you apply the rules for the, the diagnostic criteria, you can actually create two different uh, patient profiles that have, uh, meet the criteria but have not a single symptom in common. You know, somebody oversleeps, somebody undersleeps, somebody overeats, and somebody has loss of uh, ability to experience pleasure, somebody else has a depressed mood, and you can cre actually have two people who are called major depressive disorder, but they don't have a single symptom in common. So people's experience of depression may be quite variable, and this is important for reasons that I'll get into later as we try to understand what depression is and to find treatments that work for this whole category of depression. It's hard to find a treatment for something that may be many things, and so that's one of our challenges. <coughs> Further, if you think about it, there are people who have had one episode of depression, never another, those who can never remember feeling well in their lives, those who have multiple recurrent episodes over the years, those whose depressions start in childhood and those who have onset in late life, those whose depression follows a loss or a trauma or an illness or with cancer or with stroke, or those whose illness seems to come out of the blue in the sunniest of lives. Those who have loaded family histories and some with no apparent genetic influence whatsoever. There are those whose, whose suffering is complicated with substance use disorders and those who feature a delusional psychosis. And there are those who respond robustly and well to first line treatments and those who struggle over time to find any relief whatsoever. And then there are other forms of depression, as with bipolar illness, where people can suffer a major depressive episode, but it's in the context of a cycling mood disorder where they may enter other dysregulated mood states like mania or hypomania, which are quite different and which have very different implications for treatment and outcome. <clears throat> so it's a very complicated and very variable condition. So, as researchers, we are confident that we will have more clarity about subgroups as we develop the technology, the use of the biomarkers of neuroimaging, physiology, and gen genetics, that we will be able to 
tease apart these various um, subgroups of depressed um, uh, illness, depression, and be able to do a better job at uh, matching people with treatments. But even now with the breakthroughs in genetics, we're, um, just this past year, the first genetic findings of genes that influence risk for depression was published in the British uh, Medical Journal, uh, including the researchers from our department. And they identified 17 genes that um, were clearly associated with the risk for depression. But they accounted for a very, very small uh, amount of that risk. So these are complex genetics. Hundreds of genes may be contributing very small effects. And that makes it very difficult to identify a biological target uh, for treatment. Also, uh, what we've learned is that the genetics that are associated with depression uh, overlap with other psychiatric disorders, and that there is overlap between the genes that predispose for depression with bipolar disorder, uh, ADHD, schizophrenia, and so forth, and other psychiatric disorders. So it's no surprise also that with all of these conditions like depression, people often have more than one disorder. They actually meet diagnostic criteria for more than one disorder. So you have depression, you may also have substance use or ADHD or an anxiety disorder. We call that comorbidity. So it's a complicated business. And um, we have sophisticated uh, methodology now that's besides the neuroimaging and genetics and molecular psychiatry, but large data sets, big data, uh, strategies called network analysis where we can try to look to at what symptoms are most closely associated with each other in groups of people. So we can find different uh, meaningful subgroups of patients that will help us lead to treatments. And giving up more on the idea that there'll be one treatment for depression, but that we'll be able to find treatments for different uh, uh, profiles of de depression. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's becoming more like cancer research in that sense. <clears throat> one in three people who meet criteria for a major depressive disorder think about suicide. A much smaller number actually intend to um, um, suicide or plan an attempt. But over the course of a lifetime, uh, two to nine percent, the data is, uh, that's a broad range, but depending on the study, two to nine percent of those who have had a diagnosis of depression, when they die, will have died of suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for college students and those ages 25 to 34. Men are four times more likely to kill themselves than women. But women attempt suicide three times more often than men. And not everybody who suicides has suffered a depression, but of the 14,000 Americans a year who suicide, 70% of those have been depressed. But depression can kill in other ways besides suicide. As I mentioned before, it's a bodily disease. And one of the, the uh, manifestations of that that we've observed in recent years is that depression is associated with inflammation. So like other diseases, whether it's diabetes or heart disease, it turns out that our body's uh, uh, immune defense system that, can, that uh, generates inflammation in response to threat is active in depression. Uh, molecules that, that are prevalent in the body when you are sick, when you have an infection, uh, uh, things like cytokines, like interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, these are at high levels in people who are depressed. So it's not clear, it's not clear yet, the, the chicken and egg issue, whether the bodily inflammation that is seen in people who are depressed is causing the depression or is a consequence of the depression. These are the same substances, the same cytokines that are elevated when you have the flu. So it's no surprise that when you have the flu, you feel, you get to feel like what it's like to be depressed. And when you're de in depression, feels like having the flu sometimes. There is some evidence that actually treating inflammation may help 
uh, some people with depression. Some studies of using anti-inflammatories um, uh, like Celebrex uh, um, has actually shown some benefit in, in some patients with depression. Not dramatic and the evidence is inconsistent, but there's some evidence that anti-inflammatories can help. So, um, and it may be then that this explains why depression is associated um, with a shorter uh, lifespan. So depression will increase your risk of dying from a number of causes. So if you look at uh, elders in a nursing home uh, who are age matched and matched for health and you just look at those who are depressed and those who are not depressed and you come back in a year, there's a fourfold greater likelihood of uh, those with depression to have died. Um, similarly, you, in patients with diabetes who have depression, their diabetic control is uh, typically worse. If you've had a heart attack <clears throat> and you're depressed, you have a fourfold greater likelihood of dying in the next year than those who have had a heart attack and are not depressed. It's actually an, an inter, another interesting bit of data. Those post-heart attack who actually talk about uh, 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 being optimistic that they're going to do well and feeling positive and grateful that they've survived tend to do better. Chronic forms of depression, like something called double depression, which is a uh, condition called dysthymia, which is a chronic mild depression interspersed with major depression, um, has also identified a subgroup who are particularly high risk of developing new onset cardiovascular disease. So um, depression is not just an issue of uh, behavior and emotion. It's a, it's a condition that uh, is important to identify and treat because of how it affects your, your quality of life, your propensity to uh, other illnesses, and, and, your, uh, and your longevity. So beyond just feeling ill, the changes in brain biology that come with depression paradoxically also sap your resources to deal with it. So uh, people who have not been depressed are, will commonly try to motivate and encourage those who are depressed to snap out of it or just try harder or, you know, you can do it. And these are typically people who normally can do it, but you can't when you're depressed because your motivational brain is, is uh, disconnected. There's an alteration in brain connectivity between your, your prefrontal cortex and your emotional brain. Um, so um, so it, it, it has this effect of not only making you feel bad, but of blocking the very tools you need to make it better. So it's, it's no surprise that actually sometimes the missing ingredient that seems to help patients with particularly treatment resistant forms of depression are medications that increase the brain's use of dopamine, which is the essential neurotransmitter in the brain's reward system. So it's, it's not really clear why depression is so common in um, our uh, species. I mean, that would imply that the condition has evolved for some purpose in our existence. If it were only a condition that afflicted us late in life, that would be understandable because it, it wouldn't affect our you know, reproductive success. So, so why is depression so common? Some evolutionary biologists have speculated that depression actually reflects a um, bodily defensive state to threat that's designed to cause us to retreat, hide, withdraw, something they call conservation withdrawal. And um, so if it's a state that's meant to protect you from threat and, and in a way to mobilize your immune system and bodily resources as if you're vulnerable to threat, you know, your stress response system that is meant to fight off infection or bodily injury, um, it's not surprising that it is in fact more common in those who, in, who have been prepared for a world of defeat and threat. And I'll say more about that in a second. As I said, inflammation is designed to not only um, 
uh, protect you but to fight off infections as is the stress response. So the dis disorder is definitely more likely in those recently defeated as, you know, by job loss or loss of a loved one or those in a state of chronic defeat like poverty or in particular those whose brains have been wired to expect a world of trauma and defeat as in those who are victims of abuse early in life. So there's some very interesting studies if you look at children who were sus subjected to um, extreme uh, emotional dep deprivation or early trauma. And, uh, and you look at how they perceive certain kinds of stimuli, stimuli as benign or threatening, their bias in the world is really to perceive threat where others do not. So those who have um, uh, early experience with, with uh, deprivation, emotional impoverishment, or abuse uh, are actually uh, have tuned us, uh, not only their, their brain, but their stress response system to actually uh, prepare for a world of distress. And they are, in fact, more vulnerable to depression. Some recent research just published um, from the uh, neuroscience group at Mount Sinai in New York discovered that if you disrupt maternal care of mice, you produce changes in the levels of hundreds of genes in a part of the brain that primes the brain region there to be in a depression-like state, even before you see any behavioral changes. Essentially, the brain encodes a lifelong latent susceptibility to depression that is revealed only after encountering additional stress. And there are other uh, gene environment interactions that tell the same story of a particular uh, genetic vulnerability that is actually benign uh, until you experience a certain amount of stressful life events. And then those with that polymorphism or that gene variant are more likely, far more likely to get depressed than those without it. So that's what's called a gene environment interaction. It's also interesting that uh, um, there are um, measures of aging or biological mar markers of aging, such as the length of your telomeres, which are these uh, little tips on the end of your chromosome that get smaller and smaller with aging. And as they get small, as, um, uh, as cells and, and chromosomes replicate, you get more errors and it's associated with increased aging. And you can see that the, the rate of telomere change is much higher in populations that are exposed to extreme stress. And one of our groups at Mass General has also shown that you see those same changes in telomere length in patients who have suffered with depression. When a person is chronically stressed, the brain changes. Um, there's a region of the brain called the hippocampus, which is critically important for your memories, your cognition, literally for your place in the world. And brain health actually requires the ongoing incorporation of new neurons. Well, newborn neurons actually occur. We used to think that that didn't occur in the brain, that the brain, that all the neurons you got, you were born with. But it actually turns out that we create new neurons in certain regions of the brain, particularly uh, up, uh, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. We call this phenomenon neurogenesis. And, um, the factors that increase neurogenesis, it's almost like watching your rose bush in spring. You know, you see the, the arborization, the sprouting, the budding, the new growths. And in the case of uh, the brain, you see new connections being formed. You see budding, you see what are called spines growing off your neurons. And that's a normal, healthy brain. And it's necessary for resilience, for adaptation, uh, for brain health. But in a state of chronic stress, over time, this activity actually shuts down and your neurons, your axons and dendrates look like your branches in winter rather than spring. Withered, thin, no new buds, no growth, no connections. This exact same state is seen in depression. Just like chronic stress, you see this reversal or this absence of arborization and budding and, and growth. But if you treat depression, you actually see this reoccur. This neurogenesis returns along with the budding and the arborization and the new synapse form formation. And what, uh, 
what we've observed in recent years is that essentially all antidepressant treatments that are known to be effective are pro-neurogenetic. They actually increase neurogenesis. Um, so whether it's uh, ECT or antidepressants or exercise, uh, you actually uh, um, uh, increase neurogenesis. And that may be the common factor. It may well be that antidepressants are not actually treating depression. They're just uh, generally neuroprotective in allowing this normal resilience enhancement of neurogenesis to allow the brain to recover from the depressed state as it sometimes can on its own. So that's one hypothesis and there have been startup companies that have been targeting neurogenesis as um, um, what they are looking for new molecules to do um, to develop new antidepressants. And the uh, principle remains true that if uh, the drugs, drugs that have proven to be, uh, to enhance neurogenesis do have some antidepressant benefit, but they, um, the drugs that have been developed for this process have not shown any overall advantages over the treatments we have now. So why do some people get depressed and others don't? So you all understand that you have portfolios with some risk in it to varying degrees. In this case, uh, some people's genetic pro portfolio contains more risk than others. Um, I alluded to genetic factors, but a third of the variance accounting for who will get depressed is in fact genetic. That's the largest risk factor. If um, uh, a first degree relative, that would be a child, a parent, or a sibling of someone with depression has a risk roughly three times that of the general population. So that is an important risk factor, is just uh, the, uh, the, the hand you've been dealt in terms of um, uh, genetics. But there are many other factors. If that accounts for a third, that, that still leaves the majority of risk to be assigned to other risk factors. I mentioned early parental loss. Neglect or abuse is another risk factor. Persistent stress is another risk factor. Really any loss, particularly loss of a support system is a risk factor. Certainly a number of illness conditions. There are some conditions that are well known to increase your risk for depression that, uh, that doctors routinely check for, like low thyroid function. Um, there's been a lot of uh, data that suggests hormonal fluctuation, particularly in women, may account for mood changes in depression. Um, but there are also some diseases that are, that are notoriously linked to depression, like pancreatic cancer or post-stroke. So there are physical conditions that may influence risk for depression. I haven't mentioned substance use yet. I mean, it, uh, substance use certainly is an important comorbidity with depression. But when you talk about risk factors, there's, a, there's a, uh, a really a chicken and egg dilemma in that uh, substance use with depression, some call it an attempt to self-medicate, you know, uh, with medications that make you feel better when you're, when you're miserable, but have this paradoxical effect of ultimately making you more depressed, or whether depression is a, is a consequence of, uh, of substance abuse, you know, of, of, of the, uh, for example, with alcoholism. So it's, it's sometimes not clear whether you should treat the depression first or the substance use first, but clearly you should, you should treat both. So whether in some cases the substance use is a, is a symptom or whether it's a cause is not always, not always clear. So how do I keep from getting depressed? What, you know, how does, the, does somebody prevent depression from occurring? Well, with respect to genetics, the first uh, advice, of course, would be to pick your parents wisely. Um, try to time travel and have a nurturing and enriched early developmental experience. That would be good. Avoid early trauma and loss. But the other uh, message, of course, is to manage stress. Uh, and there are tools available. Um, there are cognitive tools. Uh, you know, to learn how to think about and uh, uh, handle stressful situations. Techniques that uh, sometimes are dismissed as trivial but turn out to be uh, real and brain-changing like mindfulness and meditation. 
our neuroimaging group has done these remarkable studies, first having discovered serendipitously that there were um, pre, uh, strips of prefrontal cortex that were thicker in meditators than non-meditators in a region that's associated with resilience in recovery from stress. So the question is, is that just people who meditate, that's the way they're wired, or is it a consequence? So they did a study. They took people who had not meditated, motivated them with financial rewards to adhere to a meditation um, uh, regimen, and compared those who meditated with those who didn't over a period of several weeks. And lo and behold, you see the positive changes in this region uh, in meditators. So learning to meditate is a uh, protective strategy. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, you know, it takes some practice and, and, uh, and, and um, time, but not a lot. I uh, often refer my patients to Dan Harris's book, 10% um, Happier, as a way to sort of get convinced about it and, um, and to learn some strategies. Um, so, so meditation, mindfulness. Um, we talked about inflammation, reduce the amount of inflammation in your body and brain, and that's nutritional. Uh, you know, a Mediterranean diet, whole grains, tree nuts, fruit, less red meat, less uh, refined sugar, and so forth. Is, uh, so good nutrition is good for your brain. Um, sleep hygiene. Turns out sleep is incredibly important to well-being and brain health. And um, so making sure you have an opportunity to sleep eight hours a night and uh, to, uh, to learn about sleep hygiene, things what to do and not to do so you can get a good night's sleep, al not having alcohol in the evening, not looking at your blue light on your screens before you go to bed. <laughs> I'm getting uh, raised eyebrows from the front row here. Uh, and so forth. So managing sleep is important. <clears throat> you heard a mention to, uh, about exercise. And, and uh, again, these things sound, they don't sound high tech, but this is really huge. I, I, I mentioned briefly, but exercise in animal models is as pro-neurogenesis as antidepressants. And, you know, if you, put, if you exercise your rodents, you see the, you know, the emergence of uh, um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the same robust uh, degree that you see with antidepressants. How much exercise? Well, more is better, but 30 minutes a day with stretches of you know, you know, vigorous exercise in short intervals, like high-intensity in, uh, high interval training is good, but any exercise is better than none. Maintaining a social network that is supportive is really important. Don't let your relationships go. Make up with your family members. What is it they call, they call Irish dementia? You forget everything but the grudge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, really isn't worth it over the long run. <laughs> Maintain a schedule of activities that you enjoy. Really sort of schedule things that you know you enjoy or used to enjoy. There is a form of treatment that's called well-being therapy that was designed by a Italian uh, psychiatrist, of course, uh, who, uh, who actually tries to get his patients to schedule things that they that give them pleasure or that used to as a way of you know, getting their, their brain reward system working. If your, season, if your pattern is seasonal, <clears throat> if you tend to be worse when the days get short and the nights get long, get yourself a light box and do an hour of, uh, of, of uh, having ambient uh, full spectrum lights available for an hour at the same time every day. And obviously, as uh, mentioned before, if you're having an issue with substances, get help with that. But what if I do become depressed? Um, well, I'd start with first all of the above. All the things I said about prevention are still important, uh, not only for recovery, but also for prevention of relapse. Um, the message, of course, is to seek evaluation and treatment early. The longer that you spend being depressed, the harder it is to treat. You have to determine the correct diagnosis. As I mentioned, the symptoms of depression can reflect other kinds of things, both uh, psychiatrically and, and uh, medically. So, you know, see your doctor, whether it's a primary care doctor, one who feels comfortable and likes to uh, ask about depression, or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Both the good news and the daunting news is that treatment options are really vast. Um, and the science of predicting which treatment to assign 
to which patient in which order is really lacking. We don't match well. I'll say more about this in, in a moment. What we can say is that one in three, or maybe we should say only one in three, of people with depression who seek out treatment, who get treated with a evidence-based treatment, that can be cognitive be behavior therapy, that could be an antidepressant, only one in three will respond to a first-line standard treatment. Um, but treatment is a journey, and you've got to remember that. That requires persistence because there are so many ways to treat that can work. For some, um, the right tr treatments are discovered easily, but for others it takes time and persistence. We have many medications, we have different forms of psychotherapy, we have devices called neurotherapeutics, there are alternative reg regimens, uh, nutraceuticals and others that may help some people, and combinations of all the above as well as light treatment. 60% of people, when you, when you persist, will recover, 90% will improve, that leaves 10% who have what we call treatment-resistant uh, depression, or um, I wouldn't say they have treatment-resistant depression, but they haven't responded to treatments we have. Uh, but re even when you respond, relapse is common and treatment changes are typically necessary. Between 1996 and 2005 in the United States, the percentage of patients treated with antidepressant drugs increased from about 6% of the population to about 10% or from about 13 million to 27 million people. There are many different, or there are several different um, uh, medications, as I mentioned. Um, most initiate their action through various effects on what are called neurotransmitters or monoamines like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And the medicines are really, uh, from a scientific point of view, not so different in terms of mechanism, but the small differences between them seem to allow for patients to either tolerate one better than another or to respond better to one or another. As I said, one in three will respond to a single antidepressant. A, single, a similar number will respond to the next thing you try, but after that it gets harder and harder to find the right treatment for people. The number who respond tends to be smaller, and as I said, relapses start to occur. Benefit to most of these treatment is delayed for days and certainly weeks after starting treatment and may take weeks for dose adjustments um, to occur. As I said, the number of combinations um, is, uh, is, is considerable, and so we can go on a very long time trying things until somebody responds. It can go on for a very long time. And there are many medicines that we call augmentation strategies that really can turn somebody who's non-responding into responder, but it's a trial and error thing. We have a number of, a couple of new medicines now that are promising because they treat depression right away. They're called rapids or rapid antidepressants that can work within hours or sometimes within a few days. And those are under uh, research scrutiny to see whether they're safe over the long term or whether you can retain the initial benefit over the long term. Medicines like the repurposed anesthetic ketamine or the um, intravenous use of the anticholinergic medicine scopolamine. So the fact that we are starting to see that possibility from medicines that work on other neurotransmitter systems gives us optimism that we'll have new therapies that may work for those where others have failed and may work rapidly. As far as psychotherapies, um, the, the strongest evidence for psychotherapy is for CBT or cognitive behavior therapy. That, depress, that addresses your, how you think in, in depression, your thinking patterns. Um, but it's, uh, and although it's, a, it's a very effective for milder and moderate forms of depression, finding a well-trained therapist can be challenging. A group at Emory led by the neurologist Helen Mayberg has identified changes in brain circuitry that predicts those who will respond to CBT versus antidepressants. They seem to have different brain circuitry or connectivity. Any therapy that helps you deal with life stressors, interpersonal problems, or motivation can help in the battle against depression. And then we have neurotherapeutics that are devices that influence the brain directly and relieve depression, like ECT, which you heard about earlier, which is the most effective treatment we have right now for those who have not responded to others. 
But other uh, d direct brain influencers like transcranial magnetic stimulation, direct current uh, treatments that are in development, deep brain stimulation, which is an implanted electrode in certain parts of the brain, vagus nerve stimulation, and others. Some patients ask me uh, when they get better, will I be on treatment forever? And the answer we've learned to give is, boy, you are an optimist. <laughs> because you're only going to stay on treatment if it's working. Otherwise, we're going to change. So we are uh, working hard to find new treatments. We have interesting new targets in drug development from brain energy metabolism and, and mitochondrial function. I mentioned inflammation, neurogenesis treatments, glutamate, which is how ketamine works, and the hope for rapid acting antidepressants. But as you've heard, the challenge is hard because it's such a heterogeneous disorder. Our diagnostic categories do not cleave nature at its joints. And so we're going to have to figure out how to identify subgroups of people who are different from each other. And I'll, I want to just tell you one quick story about a cancer drug called ERISA, which was a, a failed drug for a small cell cancer originally, except that the doctors thought there was a small group of people who got better. Now, in cancer, when the cancer gets smaller, it's different than somebody getting better in depression, which might have been seen as spontaneous. So the researchers thought there must be something there because they thought they saw some people. And when they went back to those people they thought that got better, they found they had a unique genetic variant in their cancer. And when they did a new study just targeting those people with that genetic variant, the drug worked, and now that drug is in 60 countries and is extending lives. It's what we have to do with depression. We have to make sense of this heterogeneity, identify subgroups with unique uh, uh, biological differences that allow us to target. And now there is science that will allow us to do this. So let me end with the, um, the um, motivational two words of, or three words of never give up. It's a journey. We have more treatments than you can count. You need to find a caregiver that won't give up. You need to find a caregiver that doesn't stop trying if you're still depressed. Our healthcare system right now is poorly configured to provide optimal care for people with psychiatric disorders in terms of uh, comprehensive care or longitudinal care. There's poor continuity of care in psychiatry. Um, the move towards population health um, management may, may offer some opportunity to have team-based care and comprehensive care but we need to see a system that's willing to allocate more, not to cut back on healthcare costs, which is uh, where we are now. And we need to find a way to reallocate what resources we have to this, um, this, this issue. So we need your voices. Um, we need to educate and, and talk to each other the way we have tonight. Uh, we need to end stigma. Uh, and we need to support each other, whether depressed or um, a loved one who's depressed. And I will end with a poem. So in 1991 in The New Yorker, I only read the cartoons, but fortunately my wife Lydia would actually read uh, the articles and, the, and other things. And she said, you gotta see this poem. It's written by a po poet with a mood disorder named Jane Kenyon, uh, who sadly died of cancer some years ago. And she wrote this. She actually um, um, had, had bipolar disorder, but uh, it applies here. And she writes, we try a new drug, a new combination of drugs, and suddenly I fall into my life again. Like a vole picked up by a storm, then dropped three valleys and two mountains away from home. I can find my way back. I know I will recognize the store where I used to buy milk and gas. I remember the house and barn, the rake, the blue cups and plates, the Russian novels. I love so much, and the black silk nightgown that he once thrust into the toe of my Christmas stocking. So thank you so much for your attention. Question? Thank you, so if you have any questions, Lydia will answer them. Yes. So as I mentioned, depression can uh, be anywhere from mild to severe. It can have different symptoms. Um, there are some people who are able 
to find uh, can function well uh, when motivated by the fear of um, social stigma, and then as soon as they're home, they just fall apart. So it can vary quite a bit. Um, so as depression gets more severe, you're more and more impaired. And there are many people in the workplace who are depressed, and they're not feeling well, they're suffering, they're having terrible thoughts, they may not be functioning at their peak, but it may not be noted. So you certainly can work if you're depressed. Again, depression can be mild, moderate, severe, and lethal. Um, it, it, uh, and there are, uh, uh, there are people who can manage in short s stretches in certain contexts to hide it. So that, that uh, being able to work is, is not an indicator that you're not depressed. Yes? Well, um, so I think the numbers I gave are, are those who meet the, the criteria, those official criteria. And uh, so if you have a few symptoms uh, uh, and not five, you wouldn't have been counted. So I would th think that the impact of depression is broader than those numbers indicate. Um, just because of the way we catalog. So there are more people who have depressive symptoms or have um, depression writ uh, large than, than are captured in the number, but I, I wouldn't know what that number is because we can't, can't measure it. You alluded to some of the issues with access to care for depression and, and mental illness in general, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about trends in access to care. Are there enough medical students going into psychiatry? Are there enough students going in to study psychotherapy? Access is a huge issue. So I live in a town <coughs> that uh, has 75,000 people. If uh, psychiatrists are evenly distributed, it should be six million people because we've got that many psychiatrists. And that's because we're... Uh, uh, Newton, yeah. Same. <laughs> and why? Because, you know, there's Tufts and McLean and Mass General and Beth Israel and Boston University. There are all these places. And even so, it's very hard to get a, a caregiver. So we have, as you heard, 600, 300 psychologists, 300 psychiatrists, 100 trainees at Mass General. We uh, get uh, 2,000 um, calls for uh, evaluation a month, and we can take 400. And yet we're huge. And we're only that way because, God bless the Mass General, they're one of the few places that are willing to take from the orthopedists and the in the cardiologist and transfer to psychiatry, we are heavily subsidized um, because the reimbursement for psychiatric care, you know, our best clinics of our 60 clinics break even and others are a subsidy. So it's hard to ask other, other institutions to do that. Um, you know, Mass General happens to be large and, you know, and uh, we also uh, raise uh, over $20 million a year in philanthropy. And without that, we wouldn't be who we are today. So that's, now, so, so that's the challenge at the most resource place in the world. You don't have to go very far to know how daunting it is. So what's happened? So medical student, interestingly, because of neuroscience and the, some of the excitement I alluded to earlier about the brain and, and uh, biomarkers and neuroimaging and genetics, you know, the best and the brightest are starting to turn back to psychiatrists. Thank goodness they waited till I was done. Um, <laughs> but the, um, so now there is an uptick. So there were 11 out of, what was it, 200 Harvard medical students who went into psychiatry this year, so that's a little bit more. But the shortage is huge, particularly in child psychiatry. So uh, when you move to this, to population health management, I mentioned that this may be helpful because now it's not a fee-for-service thing. You don't walk into this office and pay this person, and that person does this one thing, but you need comprehensive care. Where do you find your team to take care of you? It doesn't exist. Now under population health management, you're cared for in one system, and your health insurance is supposed to take care of you. And they also realize that if you don't treat psychiatric disorders 
costs go up because you know you you sicker and you don't comply with your depression treatment and you're more likely to get heart disease. So now they want to treat this stuff. So what are they doing? They can't. They, there's not enough caregivers to hire, and nobody's willing to reallocate money from you know the orthopedists, the shoulder surgeons to the psychiatrists. So what is happening? They're creating. Um, new specialties, you know, behavioral health technicians, you know, bachelor level people who are, you know, so now it's sort of a team approach. Psychiatrists up here, there's a nurse practitioner, there's social workers, and, and at first you see, you know, uh, people who uh, have, are much less expensive. So you still get a team, you may get care management, and overall it may go well. But uh, in order to create that team, you're adding, um, uh, much less specialized and trained personnel to be who may and that may well work for a lot of people it won't be satisfactory for some and there um, it's certainly for the sicker people that won't work but for um, initial treatment identifying those who have depression getting started with first-line treatments before you have to see a specialist that may help with the personnel problem um, we've started a program in Mass General we call MGH visiting um, which is um, uh, deploying our psychiatrists and psychologists through telemedicine um, to the rest of the country um, to help where there are shortages, rural areas, hospitals that can't have a psychiatrist. And so we've started doing that, and uh, so the interest has been very large, and it's been, we've, we've just been in our second year of it, and it, um, it looks like it may help in some areas, but certainly it's not a, the numbers aren't great enough to solve the national problem. We'll just help in certain areas. Yes, in the back. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know the plans yet. Um, I know that we um, have had some of our, in, our psychiatrists, particularly child psychiatrists, who have, were involved in a, uh, uh, with another clinical program on the island. Um, and obviously, uh, there, have been, there have been people in the emergency room who, who will contact people in our department when there's a diagnostic issue. I would assume that the visiting program, the telepsychiatry program, is really made for for this uh, need here, but I haven't, so far nobody's talked to us about it, but I assume that will come, I mean, it has to come. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, you know, we're, we're, you're not just a friend, you're family. Yeah, we gotta do that. Yes. Child psychiatry? Yes. So, um, one thing that I, I didn't mention, I mentioned a little bit that there are some people with depression start early in life, but almost all psychiatric disorders, the majority anyway, be, begin at, at before age 18. Whether it's depression, bipolar illness, anxiety disorders, even substance use. Um, and you can just see the, you know, the, the, the curve of what age did you start is, um, is before age 18. So it's not just an issue of treatment, it's an issue of prevention. There has to be a lot more, um, a lot more resources uh, developed to identify those at risk, those with early symptoms, and do prevention early. The future of, of this problem is not going to be creating more doctors who treat people later in life, but finding ways to prevent these things early or mitigate uh, their severity early. Um, we've got a, a very nascent program, um, which. Uh, is designed to identify kid, uh, kids at risk. It's called our Transitional Age Youth Program. And we try to identify kids who we believe to be at risk either because they've had some early symptoms or they have family history and early symptoms and get them in early and do some resilience building and other things before they actually have their first full-blown episode. So that's a model, um, and if it's a, you know if we can show it's successful, hopefully it, it will be a model that others will will uh, imitate. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, it's, it's, so the question is, uh, how, how do you destigmatize depression? And um, so it's, you know, it's a, I guess it's a good news and bad news, like many things. Uh, we've come so far, you know, uh, um, it's happening. Now the question is, how do we make it happen faster? I mean, everywhere you read now, you know, you read about depression, you read about substance use disorders, read about the opiate crisis, read about brain disease. People are learning more about it. It's not shameful the way it was before. You know, when I grew up in the 50s, you know, uh, people wouldn't talk about cancer. They would call, you know, they would say it was the C word and it was shameful and that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, we are seeing change along with understanding, understanding about its prevalence, its biology, that it's, it's not a sign of personal weakness. The strongest people I know are people who are managing with depression. I mean, uh, it's uh, one of my colleagues who uh, treats kids with uh, developmental challenges, uh, you, you know, would say, uh, the kid who's having trouble reading used to be called somebody who wasn't trying, and nobody in the class is trying harder than that kid. It's the kid for whom it comes easy is not really trying. It's the same thing with depression. People are realizing that they, these people are heroes. You know, they're getting through life carrying a, a weighted backpack. And, and, and so that's happening. It's, you know, there's more work to be done. And, you know, programs like tonight are, are, are ways to do that and talking about it. I have to tell you, when we, I mentioned our leadership council before, we started, was it 2007? We started with five, seven, ten families. And now, I mean, there are over 100 families. And they, the, the, it, the most amazing thing is how they come together and sort of look at each other and say, you, you, you really? And, and, and then they realize it's everybody. And so uh, people just have to be able to, you know, recognize that it's common and that when you bring it up, you're doing somebody else a favor because they're afraid to bring it up because it's in their family or something like it. So it's it's a snowball effect, but it's a it's a it's it's happening. Uh, how do we accelerate it? You know, doing more of this. Um, but I'm open to other suggestions. Yes. So um, transcranial mag magnetic stimulation is a device-based treatment that's pretty non-invasive, pretty benign. You don't really feel much. It uses electromagnetic waves that penetrate not too far to sort of touch on points in brain circuitry that emerge close to the surface that you can influence and alter the function of those circuits. And we know that, you know, some of the anatomy of those circuits related to depression or OCD and others and have an idea where to stimulate and you can relieve symptoms. And it's been shown to be effective for depression. The, um, there is a, a commercial device that's out there that's fairly restricted uh, on what it can do and where you can use it. But um, there are some very expert TMS doctors who have devices they, they can um, use more freely. And, um, and those, those can be pretty um, helpful uh, for people. Um, as a treatment overall, using the commercially available device and the way it's configured, it's helpful for some people, but it's very expensive, and, and, and uh, the rate of response is not that, that, imp that impressive. Um, but TMS, I think, is, uh, is going to grow as we get devices that can penetrate a little deeper, where we can uh, use other tools to uh, individualize treatment for individual patients. And so I think we'll see more from, from, the, from the stimulation therapeutic uh, arena. We'll see better uh, TMS-like devices, uh, devices that use other technologies, both electromagnetic and, and, and sonography to stimulate deeper, and better uh, tools to be able to identify differences in patient circuitry that may lead to better targets. So over the next 10 years, I would see this technology as becoming um, more helpful. It's now it's sort of something you try when other things haven't worked and it's expensive and some people get better. Our group um, doesn't use the commercially available thing. We have a neuropsychiatrist who's very sophisticated and he sort of maps out your brain and tries to work with your unique uh, biology and symptoms and we're hopeful that that approach will, will yield more results. But there are lots of other direct uh, brain um, technologies, both using um, 
infrared light and direct currents and uh, uh, magnetic stimulation, other things trying to, trying to avoid drugs that affect your whole body and just influence the, the organ of interest. Yes? Yeah. So right now, um, gene therapies are technologies that allow you to correct genetic information are really only useful for disorders that are highly influenced by single genes. And um, as I mentioned, this is uh, the, the risk of depression is probably carried in an individual by 100 genes. And so uh, it's not practical to do gene therapy per se. That said, you know, uh, there may be many genes, but they may have, you know, common pathways. And you may be able to identify from a pattern that someone's inherited which pathway might be more pertinent to target with a treatment for that individual. And that's what we're hoping for. In fact, we're trying to do now is to identify novel pathways that have surfaced through genetic studies and to see if you can target the the gene or the gene product and change behavior in, say, an animal. And if that works and if it seems to change in the right direction, to see if it might lead to new treatments. Yes? Maybe two more questions. Could you say something about the effect of ECT? So ECT um, has, is very effective. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of selecting the right people. I mean, there are conditions for which it doesn't work, but for major depression, severe depression, melancholic depression, psychotic depression, bipolar depression, it's the most effective single treatment that we have. And so it works in about 80% of people who, who um, get treated, which means there's, you know, 20% is still a large number who don't. Um, the dilemma there is that it works, it's a short-term treatment, usually six to 12 treatments. And then you have the issue, okay, if you get better, what next? If you have failed many other treatments, should you go back and try those kinds of treatments again? Or, or do you need maintenance ECT, which could be you know, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly? But it's a very effective treatment and uh, very, very safe. You know, it's done under anesthesia, you don't really see anything. Um, it's not like those images that you've seen in like uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or that kind of thing. Um, and it's, um, uh, but very effective treatment. And it seems to act in the same way we talked about before. You see a growth of what are called mossy fibers or new, new neuronal connections after ECT in the same way you do it with neuro, neurogenesis. So, yes? Okay. <laughs> So, uh, no, the, well, the ones that are not being used are more expensive. Uh, TMS, uh, you have to go every day for three weeks, and then who knows how long afterwards. It's very expensive, a few hundred dollars a shot every day. And its if efficacy is not as great as medicine. And then once you respond, you have to do something to prevent relapse. So you, that usually means medicine anyway. So you want to find a medicine that works for you, and these are treatments that you use when medicines don't work. It's similar with ECT. If light therapies turn out to be effective, um, and there's some evidence that they might, um, and you can have home devices that are not expensive, that would be great. But again, with all these things, you expect them to work for some, and often not for many others. So those for whom these things work will be lucky. Last question. We have, <laughs> okay. I guess. He's the boss. Would you be willing to address the issue of parity and insurance coverage for mental health services? <laughs> so, um, you know, you hear the word parity. I mean, it's the law. It's just not the reality. 
Um, no one really knows what that means. You know, insurance companies are required to insure you for psychiatric disorders the same as they do for any other disorder, and they don't. So why they cannot, even though it's the law, I don't really know. I don't. I, uh, uh, people need to let uh, insurance companies know, need to let their politicians know that this is not acceptable and that it matters. Um, but parity is a goal. It's a. Um, it's something that from time to time we think we've achieved with legislation, and then the reality never matches. There is a shortage of good care out there. Hospital care is a disaster. And finding a hospital, having continuity of care with your caregiver, finding a place you'd be willing to go if you had your choice is really hard, really hard. We're, trying, we're building a new hospital up in the North Shore that'll be affiliated with Mass General. We have a very small number of beds in Mass General, but we'll have 100 beds uh, on the campus of North Shore in two years, so that will help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is why I uh, love the guest lecture series. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Lydia. It was a very great evening. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you in our next uh, next. Week.